for the current rate of the Good morning and uh, good afternoon if you are logging in from a different time zone. Uh, for the next hour, uh, we're going to have the chance to speak to the one person who's responsible for the security of an area encompassing about 2.5 million square miles of water area, including the Gulf, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Oman, and parts of the Indian Ocean. And it's not just any area. Uh, this is one that is absolutely critical for uh, global commerce and the stability of the world energy markets. Uh, my name is Bilal Saab. I'm the founder and director of the Defense and Security Program at the Middle East Institute, where I'm also a, a senior fellow. It is my distinct pleasure and honor uh, to host my dear friend, Vice Admiral uh, James Malloy, the commander of uh, NAFCENT, which is the naval component of CENTCOM, uh, the commander of the Fifth Fleet, and also the commander of Combined Maritime Forces, uh, all headquartered in uh, Manama in uh, Bahrain. Uh, this conversation is a uh, part of uh, MEI's uh, Defense Leadership Series, which uh, we launched uh, just uh, last month. Uh, this is the uh, fifth episode. Um, it's, uh, it's a high level um, speakers forum for current and uh, former uh, military and defense leaders from both the United States uh, and uh, from the region. Uh, and we talk about a range of issues, obviously all related to uh, defense and uh, security. Uh, we were fortunate to uh, inaugurate the series on June 10th with uh, current uh, CENTCOM Commander uh, General Frank uh, McKinsey. Uh, the Admiral and I will uh, talk about how NAFCENT uh, sees challenges and opportunities in the region and what role the command uh, plays in the U.S. national defense strategy and whether that role will change or perhaps even increase uh, given the demands of the uh, great power competition. But before we kickstart that engagement, uh, let me introduce Jim, and then I'd like to turn it over to my boss, uh, Ambassador Jerry Firestein, who also would like to welcome uh, Jim to MEI. So as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Vice Admiral uh, James Malloy essentially has three full-time jobs. He uh, commands NAFCENT, Fifth Fleet, and Combined Maritime Forces, and we'll have a chance to talk about each uh, in a minute. He's had a long and distinguished uh, career in the U.S. Navy with multiple sea tours and deployments, including, of course, in the Arab world. His portfolio is quite um, varied uh, and comprehensive uh, with duties related to theater missile defense, uh, naval operations, uh, coordination with uh, multiple naval partners and allies, and also political military analysis uh, with the Joint Staff's uh, J-5 unit. And I'm only mentioning 10% of that portfolio. You can check out uh, the rest of the bio on the MEI website. Uh, Jim is from Silver Spring, Maryland. He's a local. Um, and he's also a graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, he's an accomplished scholar as well with impressive uh, academic credentials, including three masters, one in uh, systems technology from the Naval uh, Postgraduate School, one in national security strategy from the National War College, and one in emergency disaster management from Turo University. Uh, Jim, what a pleasure to have you uh, with us this morning. Uh, thank you for agreeing to join us, and I look forward to the conversation. Uh, let me turn it over to Jerry. Jerry? Uh, thank you, Bilal. And uh, on behalf of the Middle East Institute, I also wanted to uh, take this moment to welcome Admiral uh, Malloy uh, and, uh, and also all of you who are joining us on this uh, webinar. And congratulations to Bilal for an outstanding series of, uh, of conversations uh, with uh, senior defense uh, uh, personnel, both American and others, uh, to help shed light on where we are on uh, these important issues of Middle East security and stability strategies. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, about just about a year ago, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, participating in briefings uh, that Admiral Malloy and his team arranged uh, at uh, NAVSEN headquarters in Manama. Uh, they were uh, outstanding and therefore I'm confident that Admiral Malloy is going to uh, shed a great deal of light on uh, these issues of interest uh, this afternoon. And Admiral Malloy, uh, since you're not with us physically, I did want to uh, just mention that uh, in your honor, we have imported uh, Manama's weather uh, to Washington DC uh, so that all of us can feel at home with you as you go through this briefing. 
So with that, I will turn it back over to Bilal and looking forward to an outstanding conversation. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jerry. Uh, Jim, it's good to see you again. Uh, just like Jerry, I, I recall I was with you at headquarters um, last fall in your office, and we also had the chance to participate in uh, BIDEC, the Bahrain International Exhibition and Convention Center, which I thought was a pretty good event. Uh, my promise to you then was to host you at MEI. Sadly, we're going to have to do this virtually and on screen. Uh, nevertheless, it's great to have the chance to reconnect. Uh, over to you, Admiral. Thanks, Bilal and Ambassador. It's good to see you. Uh, we got 120 degrees here, so I'm not sure that you, uh, you're comparing with that, um, but uh, certainly probably the humidity is, is about the same. Uh, Bilal, thank you so much for setting this up, um, uh, and I enjoyed our conversation uh, that we had here, and this is maybe a continuation of that a little bit. I've got a, just a short uh, introduction, and then I certainly want to uh, reserve most of the time to any questions you might have, um, and then I'll, so I'll kick it off for you if that's okay. Um, as you stated, uh, I'm the commander of U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, and in that hat, I report to, uh, to uh, General McKenzie, who you mentioned, uh, as his naval component commander. I also serve as the commander of uh, the Navy's Fifth Fleet, uh, headquartered here, and then finally as the uh, head of the International Coalition that's known as Combined Maritime Forces, or CMF. And, and as you pointed out, you know, we operate over a two and a half million uh, square miles of waterway, uh, ranging from the wide gulfs of the Indian Ocean, uh, the approaches to the Babel Mendeb, um, and then the three busiest choke points and waterways, as you know, the Suez Canal, the Babel Mendeb, and the Strait of Hormuz. And uh, put that into context, uh, as of today, 20% or so of the world's trade passes through the Gulf of Aden. And so it's, it looks like a, 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 a large flow of forces and a snapshot at any one time, 24 hours a day. There's a lot of flow there. Um, and we watch that very carefully. Uh, NavSense mission um, hasn't changed since I was a lieutenant here. Um, it, we conduct maritime security operations, uh, theater security cooperation efforts with regional uh, allies and partners um, and other partners from outside of the region that have interests here. Uh, we strengthen partner nations maritime capabilities uh, for a, a, uh, a partnership uh, that promotes that maritime security and the free flow of commerce, which I think everybody believes and, and understands the importance of in this region. And, uh, and that brings us together almost as a common theme uh, that hasn't changed in, in since I first got here in 1992. Uh, but that's kind of an overview. The three hats that I wear, uh, very proud of each one of them and, uh, and honored to, uh, to have this role uh, for the time that I do. And I'm, very, uh, I'm looking very much forward to answering any questions that you might have on any topics. Okay, thank you, Admiral. Uh, I heard that uh, you're transitioning soon and uh, heading back to uh, Tampa to watch Tom Brady win the Super Bowl. Is that correct? <laughs> it is. Um, the uh, the detailer uh, calls me every so often to tell me he's transferring me, and I keep hanging up on him. Um, this job and and uh, and and operating out here uh, with these allies and partners and this staff. Uh, is has been the the, uh, the job of a lifetime, um, and uh, and every day going into work has been an honor. Uh, but it is probably time now to uh, to transition. Uh, I'm turning over to a great officer and a great friend um, who will uh, continue this mission and then add a little spark to it as he does. Um, but uh, yes, I will be transitioning in the next couple of months uh, back to the United States and uh, and hopefully not bring any weather with me when I come. I wish you the best of luck, uh, Admiral. Um, so why don't we just start with these uh, three hats that you have uh, and you've uh, described them. Um, you must be a very busy man. So uh, tell us where, what does your schedule look like on a daily basis and uh, what are some of the priorities and maybe some trade-offs? Okay, um, well, first of all, I, you make it sound like I'm a one-man show, which is not true. Um, and each one of these hats has a significant support staff underneath. Um, my task forces in my U.S. Navy hats uh, are divided functionally. So I have uh, task force commanders that, that run the maritime force, task force commanders that, that uh, run the aircraft carrier force, the submarine force, um, and, uh, and in the U.S. side, uh, the small destroyers and, and patrol craft uh, run that area for me, and then my mine forces as well. 
Um, in my coalition hat, um, I have a, a uh, rainbow staff, if you will, uh, made up of uh, 33 nations in the coalition of CMF. Um, my deputy is a, is a Royal Navy a one star, um, has been that way uh, in this construct for many years. And, uh, and that staff that operates the coalition force, um, it is a, a, a very a mixed uh, uh, staff of uh, personnel from the 33 countries that come and operate here with us. So uh, it's not geolocated. One is, is right next door to the other. Uh, but my day is spent uh, between those two uh, operating. Um, as the fifth fleet commander, I'm a force provider to my hat as the naval component commander uh, for General McKenzie. So in that way, I'm kind of sitting in the same chair uh, in, in many ways. But, uh, but my day is, is spent between uh, those two hats operating um, in a US Navy hat, uh, providing that maritime security and, and answering the mission calls of US Central Command, my boss, General McKenzie, who you met on, on your webinar a month ago, a uh, month and a half ago. And then in the coalition hat, uh, putting uh, the uh, three task forces of CMF to see operating and conducting the mission statements that we all have combined to do. Um, I also, uh, and those are the three enduring hats. Um, I am also uh, the supervisor and the uh, maritime force commander of, uh, of task force Sentinel, the IMSC, uh, currently commanded by a Royal Navy one star. Um, he works down the uh, passageway from me, from a headquarters there, uh, commanding those eight countries' um, forces uh, in that mission. And I'm ready to discuss that as well um, at, your, at your discretion. Yeah, we'll have a chance certainly to uh, delve deeper into a Sentinel, because um, I am a fan, as you know, uh, Admiral. Um, any good student of world politics will probably start with uh, national interests. So why don't we just start with interests? Um, a core interest of ours uh, in that part of the world is, uh, as you mentioned it yourself, uh, freedom of commerce and navigation uh, in the waters of the region. We may not rely as much uh, on Middle Eastern oil, but we sure have a stake in the stability of the global energy market and the price of oil, which obviously is affected by events in the region. Uh, and the responsibility to police those regional waters uh, falls on your shoulders. T tell us what other U.S. interests uh, is your command helping to protect? And uh, equally important, has anything changed uh, in how we view those interests in the region? Any trade-offs? Yes, uh, that's a great question. Well, first to the uh, to the global trade, and you're right. You know, about ninety percent of the world's uh, trade goes by by water. Um, one thing that surprised me when, when I got here, uh, quite frankly, a year and a half ago, started looking at numbers, um, is everybody focuses on the oil um, and, uh, and the export of the oil. 50% of China's oil comes out of the Strait of Hormuz, for instance, um, as, as a number. Uh, but what amazed me was that this area, the Indian Ocean um, and the, uh, the approaches to it from the Babo Mendeb, from the Strait of Hormuz, and then over from the Eastern portion, um, is a pivot point for a lot of global trade that is not oil. Um, the, trade, uh, the trade lines between Europe and Asia, uh, where uh, things are produced in one area and sold somewhere else, and then produced in one area and sold somewhere else. Uh, significant amount of production inside the Arabian Gulf with the GCC countries that they export and then they import as well. Um, so the, the global commerce, when people say global commerce and free flow of commerce within this region, they focus on oil, which is important. And as you, as you, as you mentioned, the U.S. is now a, an exporter of, of oil, but the oil market across the globe is what determines price and availability, and, and as you know. And so maintaining that steady flow here is good for the region, um, it's good for the world, and that stability and, and assurance of that, that merchant traffic is one of our key elements uh, that we focus on. Um, so in, in terms of uh, maintaining stability in the region, uh, our national interest is in the past, there have been uh, the export of terrorism uh, from this region. Um, so our, our, our partners in the region uh, provide stability, which in fact then deters that type of activity which can be exported. And so maintaining our relationships with our regional partners here um, and, their, and their good governance um, and their rule of law 
um, that, that we uh, partner with uh, in the maritime for me uh, is in their national interest, along with protecting that, that trade in and out of this area. So when you look at the, at the, at the maritime um, area and, and things that can be stabilized, I think in two ways, two lines of effort. One, people that would utilize the maritime to, to flow things out in and out that would be nefarious. Uh, terrorism, smuggling, um, human trafficking, those types of things. And then the others are people that would use the maritime itself to coerce, to intimidate. Um, so the maritime itself would not be a, a roadway, it would actually be a battlefield. And, uh, and these are the two things I concentrate on, the two things that we seek to deter, because by deterring that type of activity, we are in fact assuring um, the, the, the globe that it's business as usual, um, legitimate traffic is moving as it should. And, and this has been a focus of ours, especially in the past 18 months or so. Okay. Let's talk about the uh, ongoing crisis, uh, the one we've been facing over the past few months um, caused by the uh, coronavirus. Um, tell me how has the pandemic uh, affected read the readiness at NAFSENT and any other challenges this has uh, posed for you? Okay, well, first of all, I have to give a shout out to our host nation here, um, you know, who has um, done two things. One thing, it, one is that they have been uh, very proactive uh, in, in trying to mitigate and contain this virus. And the second thing that they have done is they have, as they always have, welcomed us and the other coalition partners as members of their, of their country and their family. And, uh, and, and there is no daylight between how they take care of their own, how they take care of us. And it's something that we count on, but we never take for granted uh, here in Bahrain. Um, in terms of uh, the pandemic um, and how it affects us in the maritime, um, the first thing is that uh, when you are a ship at sea, um, you are limited in your ability to be able to reach back to medical facilities uh, you know, that are land-based. Um, right. Although our bigger ships have uh, a very credible uh, and extensive capability to be able to uh, respond to any medical emergency, um, the idea of keeping that virus in check when we are at sea is something that the coalition all agree to. Now, one thing about a very established coalition like CMF is that when trouble looms, we come closer together. And so in that realm, we all agree that the virus at sea is a bad thing. It would challenge all of us, threaten all of us. And so we immediately organized how we would share best practices together to keep the virus in check from our ships at sea. And, uh, and for me personally, um, that, has, uh, that has shown itself in how we keep our ships operating out here, um, how we keep them supplied, um, I am blessed with a Navy that I can have that Navy remain at sea for long periods of time and supply them with something that we've trained to do for 80 years, 90 years. I can sustain them at sea. I can resupply them. Um, I can move personnel back and forth. And we've been doing that out here since the COVID virus um, uh, showed itself. Each one of the countries that we operate with here has also put um, mitigations in place for when we do pull into those countries to be able to protect the, our sailors and protect the, the people that work with our sailors uh, peer side uh, to be able to make sure we're taken care of. Because again, operational readiness and the ability to answer mission tasking is priority number one, but we only do that by keeping our sailors safe. And this is a common theme that all of our countries have and we share together as we maintain our readiness out here. I will tell you quite honestly, Bilal, that I have not had one of my task force commanders, be it a coalition task force commander or a US task force commander say, I can't do a mission because of COVID. Right. I've heard them say, COVID is a challenge, so this is how I'm gonna do the mission anyway. Yep. And I'll tell you what I've learned about that. And, yep. and this has been a common theme across all of our task forces, US and coalition uh, since COVID struck. That's really good to hear. Uh, and thank you for that description. Uh, let's talk about the maritime security environment. Uh, so you've assumed command um, 18 months ago, is that correct? About that, yes. Right. 
Uh, to tell us how has the environment evolved? I mean, have things gotten worse or better? Well, we we saw a uh, a couple of watershed events last spring, which I know you're tracking. Right. Um, there was um, as as uh, the U.S. pulled out of JICPOA, um, and as some uh, sanctions relief was uh, was was uh, uh, turned off. Um, we, uh, in the maritime, were looking to see if there would be a response um, from Iran um, that would be in the maritime and would be kinetic in nature. And, uh, and, and as always, maintain readiness uh, for any uh, potential um, uh, incursion that might occur. And as you know, in May, uh, there was an attack, uh, a mine attack by the Iranians on four uh, ships at anchor in the, in the outer harbor of Fajira. Right. Um, and we saw that. And, and uh, the following month in June, uh, there was an attack uh, by uh, Iranian maritime uh, forces on two ships uh, sailing in the Gulf of Oman, the Front Altair and the Kokoko Courageous in June. Um, we also saw a shoot down of one of our uh, unmanned uh, aircraft flying in international waters um, in June. Uh, and then uh, we saw the, the British uh, heritage, which was a, uh, uh, what they call a Red Ensign Group um, flagged tanker, uh, an attempted seizure of that uh, in, the, in the Central Arabian Gulf, and then a successful seizure of the Stena Impero and the MedStar, um, a Liberian ship, uh, Stena Impero, a, royal, uh, a British flagship um, in, in, uh, in July. And, uh, and that was the beginning of what ended up becoming um, Sentinel in response to that. Uh, there have been activities uh, since then. Um, we have intercepted uh, two large shipments of weapons um, bound for Yemen, identified by Iran, uh, one in November and then one in February of this year. Um, and so we have seen this evolution of activity in those lines of effort that I spoke of earlier, where utilizing the maritime for nefarious activities, and then also doing that nefarious activities in the maritime to coerce, to intimidate, um, you know, regional actors and the, the merchant communities um, with these illegal acts. Um, and again, this is why um, Sentinel stood up. We have not been idle at this time. Um, you know, it is a very big contrast between um, this type of activity and our activity. In November, uh, we had what is called the IMX or International Maritime Exercise. Again, a very positive, uh, defensive, not provocative uh, exercise but that gathered together 50 nations uh, that had forces or staff that came into the region uh, to promote this positive vision of a secure maritime open for all legitimate traffic. Seven international community participated. Uh, we, we, last summer, we did a maritime security conference, um, which uh, we convened here physically uh, upstairs in the, in the conference area uh, that had 30 plus heads of Navy and regional partners and outer regional partners to discuss a positive vision of maintaining, protecting maritime security. We had to do that last week virtually, uh, much like this. Um, not optimal, uh, but certainly technology allows us to do that. Um, and so we have, uh, in an inclusive way, brought together many nations and common themes that all can agree to, uh, to balance out this nefarious one-off acting that we see on the other side. Um, so speaking with the rule of law, speaking with the international community, and, and a common uh, uh, joining element that way. At the same time, we have been sharpening our defensive uh, shield, if you will, um, operating with coalition forces, operating with US forces. Um, I have uh, brought aircraft, uh, US, Air, aircraft, US Air Force aircraft and a rotor wing at sea, um, sharpening my capability to be able to respond um, very uh, aggressively to a threat should it occur, um, because I cannot sit idly and watch this, this creeping um, coercive activity at sea without setting a defensive posture that can respond to it and making sure that everybody understands that my first uh, mission is to be able to respond to those types of threats, deter them if necessary, if I can, 
but if I cannot deter them to respond very forcefully to them. So we have been busy at the same time um, in our operations and, and in our response posture, uh, both as a coalition force uh, and as a US, uh, US Navy out in the, in the Middle East. You know, it's interesting as you describe those uh, incidents at sea, for those who are less familiar, you think that the Iranian Navy is a naval juggernaut, which obviously it is a conventionally inferior uh, adversary to not only us, but to the wide network of partners and allies that we have in that part of the world. Nevertheless, they do pose threats. They resort to asymmetric means. Tell me if there are any capabilities that the Iranians have that particularly worry you. You know, I really, uh, I, I can't think of anything that they do that keeps me up at night. Um, you know, I, I, I always concern myself with intent because if you look at the, at the IRGC, for instance, the Revolutionary Guard Navy, um, sometimes their activities that are provocative in nature are just bad seamanship. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, it is still poses a threat to our force because it's bad seamanship. Uh, we yeah. saw that uh, activity uh, in April up in the Northern Arabian Gulf where they closed in on our ships within meters of our ships. And I'm, I'm not sure if they had an intent to, uh, to provoke, um, but uh, with our Navy and the coalition navies being the adults in the room um, and, uh, and, and not, not being a position to try to, to provoke or to, or to continue an argument. Um, so I worry about that. I worry about when that can become intent. Um, and uh, so they're very opaque as you would know um, uh, and, and what their intentions are, um, but they, they continually um, act as, uh, as provocateurs, if you will, in the maritime. In the Straits of Hormuz, at Strait of Hormuz and the Nag, you know, there are things that good mariners do when they see each other and meet each other at sea. The yep. first thing you do is they eliminate chance of miscalculation. I yep. never turn left. I always turn right. Every ship turns right. So if you meet another ship at sea, you're not going to bump into them because good mariners do that. They don't drive in front of each other. When we go through the Strait of Hormuz, we prepare ourselves for that type of activity uh, because yep. that's what we would usually see. Um, so I don't worry about capability because I know what capability we bring to bear. Um, sure. and, uh, and it is substantial. It is a defensive shield and it is an offensive weapon on behind that, that defensive shield uh, that there's no doubt in anyone's mind how that would end. And there's no doubt in anyone's mind in this region how that ends. And so I, I concern myself with the intent um, and, uh, and uh, how that would metastasize and look, should, should something be started by the other side? And, uh, and then how fast our response would be and then how fast we would be able to um, seize the initiative and, and move in the direction we need to move. What about the mining activity, Admiral? I mean, that must be something that is of concern, right? It, it mine, mines are a concern across the globe. Um, and obviously in this region, um, we have a significant amount of shallows in the infrastructure. In the Arabian Gulf, for instance, you know, it's, it doesn't get real deep here. Um, yep. Once you get outside or you get into the Strait of Hormuz and down into uh, the Gulf of Oman, uh, you, you start getting a little deeper. And the yep. approaches to Fajira, for instance, you know, they, they go shallow uh, very gradually as they go up. Um, so mines are a concern across the region, not just in the, uh, in the uh, Arabian Gulf, North Arabian Sea, but also in the Red Sea, um, because all of the infrastructure where, our, uh, where the merchant fleets pull into to get their, uh, their supplies or their oil uh, are vulnerable for that. Um, we have in the United States Navy uh, partnered with regional partners. Um, we just did an exercise with the UK and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia about a month, a month and a half ago. Um, we all bring different capabilities to bear. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there is expeditionary uh, mine countermeasures. There are now unmanned uh, systems that we use uh, much more than when I was an ensign in the Navy. Uh, we bring uh, mine sweepers to bear. The Royal Navy brings mine sweepers to bear. But every one of these nations has a capability. They have a knowledge of the bottoms uh, in the areas where they operate in. 
And so one of the things in this IMX uh, uh, exercise we did back in the fall, 50 nations providing uh, forces, one of the lines of effort was mine countermeasures. And I would yep. just remind you that um, all of the exercises that we do with our coalition partners here um, are defensive in nature, mine countermeasures. There was no line of effort for mining. There was no line of effort for uh, uh, anti-surface warfare. These were all lines of effort for defending against that type of activity. And so our focus and our line of effort for mines is countering that, uh, detecting when mining does occur, uh, and, then, and then ensuring that those mines are cleared so that we can again reinstate a free flow of commerce. Uh, in the region. But you're right, there's vulnerabilities here, I will not lie. There are vulnerabilities here. And this is something that we and all of our coalition partners, specifically in the region, are, are moving forward together, uh, aligned, aligned together. Yeah. Admiral, I'm sure you're uh, tracking this. Um, there have been a series of mysterious explosions in Iran lately. Um, uh, and we just don't know who's the culprit. Um, I wonder if this is really something that worries you, whether that increases the likelihood of a confrontation with the RGC at sea. Um, how are you preparing for this? Anything in different that, that you're doing uh, from what you've described already? Um, tell us your thoughts about that. Yes, and I gotta be honest that. with you, Admiral, uh, <laughs> I'll, I will adopt the question, but this is a question coming from friends in mainstream credible media. So, but I'll adopt it. <laughs> Understood, and uh, and thank you for that. Um, we part part of our posture here, um, and and setting that posture is based upon our assessment of intent and capability in any potential adversary. And so we watch capability when it when it shows itself. Uh, we watch the rhetoric that sometimes actually links it to capability. Sometimes the rhetoric is fiction, and um, yep. we see that often in this region as well. Um, but we link that and to our, uh, to our own posture based upon that. And then intent will go up and down based upon uh, what is happening in the region. If there are tensions in the region, uh, we think that that could lead to miscalculation. It could lead to a, uh, um, a larger um, acceptance of risk on the part of any potential adversary. Um, we watch uh, economic uh, outlooks that could drive uh, intent or assessment of risk. So we watch all of those things. And, and I, I will tell you the truth. When you see something like that occur, you watch the rhetoric in the response, you watch the posture in response, and you set your forces in a deterrence manner uh, in, in response to that. Again, very careful because I don't have an offensive line of effort. Yeah. I don't have one. I, I don't have a mission like that. Um, but I can't lose round one of any fight, That's right. even if someone else gets to ring the bell. Um, so I'm not in a position to be surprised and I will not be surprised if someone else initiates a conflict. So whenever we watch something like that, we watch for what the response would be and see if someone would miscalculate or misassign uh, you know, uh, the provocateur of that and, and possibly bring that into the maritime. And we make sure we're ready for that. And we share that information, that assessment across the coalition. One of the other benefits of that is that we are now uh, of, of many sets of eyes looking at that, at that process and sharing that assessment and then setting a posture that makes sense across the whole coalition. Because again, part of the discussion is when, when 33 nations come to work under CMF, the protection of those forces uh, becomes a sacred trust that we have. And, uh, and we will not compromise that any more than we would compromise a defensive posture of our own forces to make sure we're able to respond to any threat. So this is a part of the world where um, burden sharing is not conceptual, it's actually real. Uh, you've, mentioned, you've mentioned what we do with um, regional partners and international allies. I want you please to describe to uh, the audience uh, what contributions really you're getting from say the Gulf partners, for example. Yes, um, all, all of the Gulf partners that, uh, that are part of CMF, um, and, and this is uh, now since 2001, 
um, when I got here uh, shortly after 9-11, uh, um, uh, there was waiting for us uh, GCC partners saying, uh, you know, we have a mission, let's figure this mission out together and let's partner to make sure that we're uh, moving forward together in this region. Um, all of the regional partners have a maritime security interest, as you would imagine. Um, they have infrastructure uh, very close to their, um, their shoreline and inside their shoreline. Uh, they have uh, their, their uh, territorial waters that they protect. And then they have infrastructure that goes into their economic zone as well. Um, all of them have a Coast Guard and Navy relationship between the, their, their inside of their country. And then all of them have then provided support for what I would call the third layer, which is the coalition force, which the US and, and other uh, partners from outside the region uh, are partnered with. Uh, and within CMF, uh, that shows itself within the three task forces that we have, uh, CTF 150, which does maritime security uh, outside the Arabian Gulf, uh, currently commanded by the French and a French UK staff, shortly going to be assumed by the, uh, the Saudi uh, naval force to be led. And then you have CTF 152, which has very much the same mission inside the Arabian Gulf, maritime security. That is almost completely now led by uh, the Arab nations, currently led by the Jordanians, uh, mm -hmm. running that force for us. Um, and a very much a, a rainbow coalition of staff uh, that is about 200 yards this way from me uh, that operates in that staff. Almost completely run by uh, the GCC nations, plus uh, the, obviously Jordan uh, has run it, uh, Pakistan has run it, other countries have run it in the region, um, and now supported with LNOs or liaison officers from, from us, uh, but run there. And then CTF 151, which is a counter piracy mission. Um, and that, that is currently run by Turkey. Um, and, uh, and that runs specifically in the Gulf of Aden and the Horn of Africa. Um, so these, four, these, these uh, countries uh, participate with staff, they participate with LNOs and liaison officers, and then they participate with ships and aircraft operating in this region. So in the last 20 years, we have watched the GCC countries and other countries from this region assume larger and larger leadership roles and also put their forces to sea ever more capable of that blue water mission. So not only are they doing their, their inside of territorial water mission, their inside of their economic zone mission, but also reporting for operations out here in the blue water, knowing that that layer of defense provides that, that security that they need and then that, that information flow. The other part I will tell you is the Naval Operations Centers across the region are much more connected than they ever have been before. I can, with my IMSC country partners, uh, obviously Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, I can now share a secure picture with their Naval Operations Centers. 10 years ago, that was not possible. And now it is almost standard. Uh, if, we, if we lose five minutes of communication, that's a strange thing for us during the day. So all of these things are now building this more formidable shield of defense as those capabilities grow and our interoperability grows. Um, so it's a much more capable coalition force than we've ever had at sea before. Okay, so we've determined or affirmed that there is a high level of cooperation and coordination uh, between us and um, the Arab partners. But, but I wanna hear from you, what are some of the challenges that uh, you think they face still, what do they need from us? What do we need more from them? Because it's obviously not perfect. Uh, it's growing, but what can we do to boost that? That's a good question. I, I think um, as these navies, uh, you know, obviously each country has its own national interests um, that, they're, that they're protecting. And uh, one of the entering arguments to CMF um, which has kept this coalition strong, is that there is never a direction to any force within CMF that would ever challenge national mandates. Yep. In other words, there are some countries that can do counter piracy and yep. they can't do counter smuggling. Sure. And when they come to us with that, uh, that caveat, if you will, that, that, is, that is sacred to us. 
and yep. and their role is is enshrined in their own national interest. So we sure. protect that. Um, all of us have uh, challenges in force flow, in our ability to uh, have ships at sea maintain that um, that that capability. It requires us to be much more efficient amongst us um, and to be much more coordinated as we move forward. Um, that is, I think that the big challenge is to make sure that we all understand the value of steel in the water, um, coordinating that steel in the water, making sure that it is where it needs to be. It is optimized to be able to share that information and to build that shield. Um, but it is a challenge. It is a challenge for us um, as you know, we have global uh, interests, as you know, um, and so we compete across the globe for where our forces are, um, how the forces are arrayed, and what they do while they're here. So it is my job, as I report to the Chief of Naval Operations, as that force provider for General McKenzie, uh, to make sure I'm optimizing the use of those forces. It also is in our best interest to coordinate with allies who also provide forces to this region to make sure we're optimizing those forces. So uh, destroyers that may come from the Royal Navy, uh, destroyers that may come from France, destroyers that may come from Australia, um, yep. J from Japan, from, from the Republic of Korea. We make sure that we are, uh, we are planning that, their operations together, um, linked together to make sure that they are answering their national mandates, also participating in coalition forces. And uh, this is a very rough and tumble uh, planning uh, process, uh, but it's one that we enjoy it is one that we uh, we collaborate with, and it brings us together as a team out here in the Middle East. The reason why I emphasize this, uh, Admiral, and you know this very well, it's because, you know, in recent years, there's been increasing rhetoric uh, coming out of Washington from top leadership about free riding on the part of Arab partners and even international allies. And so I've always believed that that picture is very different at sea, uh, and that there is, that that message should be more effectively conveyed to senior leadership in Washington that uh, uh, there is a greater sense of burden sharing and a higher level of coordination and cooperation that is going on at sea. Um, and I'm sure you agree with me on that. And, and I, I would agree, and I would agree that the trend is positive um, in that if you look at, at who has commanded our CTFs over the course of the last 15, 16 years, um, yep. more and more it is regionally led uh, more and more, uh, the capacity building mission that we have equates to burden sharing um, in this region. Um, I think that we will always have a role here um, and uh, because we always have national interests here and our partnerships uh, and our allies in this region uh, will always want to partner with us uh, as, a, as a partner of choice. And we like that, we want that. Um, but more and more, this is a, a, an equitable um, uh, balance uh, between us. And, uh, and we count on them for their knowledge of the region, um, their sense of ownership of the mission, their commitment to the maritime. It is something that is, uh, that is humbling and staggering to watch. Um, as pound for pound, uh, they have shown great capability, uh, great ability to partner with us, um, and a commitment to move forward uh, owning more of this mission in partnership with us. So I've watched that trend over the course of 20 years and, uh, and I see it still moving in that direction uh, and, and probably increasing in rate. Yep. Let's uh, discuss uh, Sentinel, uh, Admiral. Um, you and your colleagues have been very careful not to depict this initiative as an anti-Iran initiative, even though I think we all agree that the main threat that we po we face at sea is from Iran. Tell us what the purpose, specific purpose of Sentinel is, and how can we get more Europeans on board? Because uh, the Europeans have their own separate initiative, um, and we would love to see more European participation. What can we do to alleviate some of the concerns of the Europeans and get them on board? Okay. Well, first of all, um, you know, Sentinel. Um, was born of a response to a threat. Yep. And as I've said before, it is threat-based, but it does not threaten. Um, it, it, uh, it provides a deterrence uh, because there is a, um, 
a large body of evidence that says that this activity, this state-sponsored activity, um, is is uh, driven by a desire to be clandestine, to obfuscate, to deny. Um, you know, if you look, if you watch the rhetoric that came out after the clearly mining activity that happened uh, from JASC and from Chabahar into Fujairah and into the Gulf of Oman. We didn't do it, nobody saw it, uh, that type of thing. And if you watched the, uh, the clear um, desire to not have fingerprints on uh, this nefarious activity as someone removed a mine from the Kokoko Courageous under the glaze of the international spotlight, it is clear that um, one of the things that deters this type of activity is the ability to document, uh, to be able to report uh, this activity uh, at sea. And so one of the lines of effort for us is the deterrent value that providing our sentries and our sentinels at sea, uh, coordinated with each other, providing that surveillance capability uh, has acted as a deterrent to that activity um, since Sentinel has stood up in the July, August timeframe uh, with the nascent capability that has been added to since then as partners uh, joined us, uh, now up to eight partners. Um, a ship at sea operating and promoting maritime security acts as a deterrent. Um, we believe, we believe that because we are dealing with a state sponsored, uh, with state sponsored activity at sea, that that construct needs to be tighter in nature in command relationships, in, in self-defense, in our ability to respond to it. Because in CMF, uh, dealing with non-state sponsored activity, um, pretty much any gray hull out there can deter a pirate. Any gray hull out there can deter a smuggler. Um, and so our, our, the threat that is posed by that activity against our ships operating in CMF is not as, as great or, or demanding. Sentinel is a different construct. The state-sponsored threat can be greater and can appear and, and show itself with little notice. And so our construct in IMSC, Sentinel moving forward, has a more coordinated, more formal command relationship at sea and has a construct that allows for us to defend each other when we're out there operating together. A little bit more formal in terms of information sharing because it is threat-based. It is designed to respond and deter the threat that is state-sponsored, which is a greater threat than the individual pirate or the individual smuggler that CMF is designed to, to respond against. So um, that is why we developed um, in construct with our GCC partners, in construct with other uh, partners, the Australians and, and the Royal Navy and here at the beginning with us, uh, with Bahrain, with uh, Saudi Arabia, with the UAE, we designed this construct to be able to deter that threat. And then if that threat metastasized, to be able to respond to it uh, in a defensive uh, architecture. Um, other, other countries and other uh, constructs are out here operating. Um, and we acknowledge that, uh, that they're doing that. They have a different approach. Um, they are under, under different circumstances, allies and partners that we support um, and, and operating out here. Um, the French operate, for instance, under our CMF uh, construct, operating uh, both in command of some of our task forces as members of the staff here on CMF. A uh, director of plans is French here. Um, and there are ships that operate with us in, in, in bilateral relationships. We just completed an ASW exercise with the French Navy out in the Gulf of Oman. Um, so uh, people see this as, as friction and as a challenge. Um, I see it as another opportunity for us to coordinate, um, recognizing that, that if you look at the mission that, that unites us, whether it be CMF or whether it be uh, IMSC, um, it's not anti this, anti that, any, anti anything. It is promoting maritime security, promoting the free flow of commerce, assuring uh, mark merchant, uh, the merchant fleets uh, that we are out here patrolling and protecting that legitimate flow. There's nothing anti about that. It's not anti Iran. It's not anti any country. Um, yeah. Because any country that promotes that shouldn't have anything to worry about with, with that positive vision 
of the region. And it sure. is a common denominator that all of us can get on board with, regardless of what construct they come from or the different, uh, the different command relationships that they bring. So I, I'm a glasses half full person, and, uh, and it certainly is half full or overflowing in this region uh, with people that agree with that concept and that want to provide forces in support of it. Yeah. I'd like to devote the last uh, 10 minutes or so to um, this uh, concept of the great power competition, even though I bet you that many of my former colleagues at the Pentagon would have preferred that I actually start with the great power competition, given okay. that these are the new marching orders. Uh, but uh, I want to ask you a question about China. Tell me if I'm reading this uh, correctly. So, you know, on the one hand, we want to discourage, speaking of free riding, uh, Chinese free riding on our security, right? We are the ones who are responsible for providing regional security, and yet they're the ones who benefit the most because they are far more reliant on oil coming out of that region um, for their economy. So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, we've got this new priority of competing with China uh, across the globe. And also we're not that sure about their intentions in the region and also their capabilities. Um, how do you manage that? Is that a strategic dilemma or am I misreading this? No, I, I think you're, you're reading it correctly. You know, I have, um, you know, a maritime hat that I wear, but then also in terms of, and I have a very regional uh, focus then I have a larger focus across the globe. And I've answered this question in different forms before. Um, you know, the, the Chinese have a presence out here. Um, they've had a, a continual presence for uh, over 10 years of a, of, a, of a naval force, a small one, um, but uh, operating for the most part in the Horn of Africa, Gulf of Aden, out here. Um, they have a base of operations in Djibouti um, right. that they're expanding. Um, they have invested in some infrastructure in the region, specifically Gwadar, as it comes to mind. Um, what concerns me uh, in, in this region is not uh, the combat capability in the near term. Um, it, it, but what concerns me is uh, all, all levers of national power that come to play. And when I take a look at this region, um, I, I only have to look east uh, to be able to see what the future might look like in the South China Sea. Yeah. And I see economic coercion. I see military coercion. Depending on what lever works to be able to bend uh, you know, the reality or the facts on the ground um, to a different uh, rule-based, uh, you know, reality. And, and so you pick your country out there um, and in some sort of uh, disagreement with China and see how those levers are being applied. And then you move into this region and you say, okay, well, 15 years from now, you've got investment in East Africa. You have um, some contracts for building of some port facilities. And then you've got a military uh, uh, complex working out in the corner of Africa. Okay, what does this look like when now, after all of this, you know, the weapons exporting in this area, what does this look like when there is a desire to change the facts on the ground from the international rule-based order that you mentioned that has been, you know, a good thing for the entire globe? but to bend it now to a different rule base and the people that might disagree with that. Now there are levers to be applied across the dime, if you will, across each one of these countries that is now beholden in some way or ability to be coerced in some way uh, by, that, uh, by that, uh, that country now moving into this region. And we see signs of that. Uh, you know, China's already on record of saying that they, wanna, uh, they want to end the embargo, uh, the weapons embargo on Iran. And I've gone through the litany early as we spoke about what Iran is doing with their arms, whether it be, you know, moving forward with their ballistic missile capability, whether it be exporting arms to destabilize the region into Yemen and other places into Iraq. You see this and you're saying, OK, so this is the this is the side that they're they're voting on. So they show us a little bit of what the future looks like in that way. And that concerns me as a global uh, a global partner. Uh, not just looking at the military complex of today, my military challenges of today. I'm not challenged by China in this region today. I'm not. Um, but what does this look like 10 years from now? And as an investment investor into this region and these partnerships, which are so important to us and so critical to us moving forward together, 
I see this and that concerns me. So that, that's kind of my perspective on, on China today, but then China tomorrow and China in the future. Well, if there's anybody who does uh, long-term thinking really well, it's, uh, it's the US Navy. Um, let me stay on the subject of China um, and uh, ask you uh, about this uh, so-called partnership between Iran and uh, China. I know there's a whole lot we don't know yet, but what's your initial reaction to that? I look at that in terms of uh, potential threat. Um, I, I look at it in terms of uh, empowering a, uh, a military that has um, suffered from, um, as intended, suffered from uh, an economic uh, a squeeze on them, um, which is intended to deter activity, which is an anathema to the globe. Um, you know, the ballistic missile uh, and, and um, uh, development uh, that, that threatens the whole region and threatens people outside of the region. Um, the, the continued nuclear, uh, nuclear investment uh, that they have, and then what we've seen in the region. So, you know, I see this as a potential catalyst for that type of activity, amplifying that type of activity, empowering that type of activity in the region. Um, and so there's obviously things that, that, that China serves to benefit from that as well, because as I said, 50% of their natural resource, their oil comes from inside the Strait of Moose, outside the Strait of Moose. So they see that economic engine as being vital in this area. Um, you know, the, the monsoon book that we've all read uh, on the string of pearls. Um, but uh, I see that in terms of how that would metastasize in a military uh, environment in the near term um, with weapon systems, with ships, with missiles, aircraft, those types of things which could act as a catalyst um, and an incentive uh, for Iran to head down a pathway uh, which would not be good for them because as I said, uh, you, you, we know how that ends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Admiral, I want to be uh, respectful of your time, uh, so let me just fire one last one. Um, sure. As you're about to transition and head back home, um, you're going to write down on a piece of paper uh, some things um, that you would pass on to your successor in terms of advice. What would be the top piece of advice for him or her? I, I would tell him, don't come because I want to stay, <laughs> um, because... In so many ways, this is home to me. And, uh, and these, these people that I've gotten to work with have been home. Um, but if I have to leave, um, I would tell him that, uh, that this engine runs on inclusivity, that this, uh, this is a partnership out here that is, is born of, of, of adversity and challenge. Um, the first place we look is right and left because our partners get closer to us uh, when, uh, when faced with a threat. Um, it is how this engine runs out here. Um, we have a place, there is an important role for the US to play here um, that is enduring. Um, it's changing and evolving over time. Again, the burden sharing becomes more equitable as time goes by because uh, that is the mission of, of our regional partners to take a larger role in that. Um, but that uh, as he takes over this portfolio, uh, which he will within the next month or two, um, I would say to embrace that, um, to, uh, to recognize that there's so many more opportunities here than there are challenges, uh, because this coalition um, ha has survived warfare. Um, it has survived peace. It is a positive vision for the region. Um, and it is uh, probably, of all the hats that I wear, it is probably the most rewarding one. Um, and with our Bahraini host, first and foremost, working out from then to the GCC and other nations in the region, you know, anchored on the, on the Western side by Egypt, anchored on the Eastern side by Pakistan, great naval regional partners and everybody in between um, that, that provides that, that, uh, that capability. Um, this is something that uh, I quite frankly have missed because I haven't been able to travel as much as I'd like to in the COVID environment. Um, but I would ask him to embrace that as early as possible and, uh, and build on those relationships, because that's the positive future uh, for, this, for this region um, that the US is a part of, always has been, and always will be. Admiral, I want to thank you for your time uh, immensely and for all the insights that you shared with us uh, this morning and this evening uh, in your time.
this was a very important opportunity for us uh, to solidify our partnership with the CENTCOM. Uh, we want to wish you well. We want to wish you good luck heading back home, but we also want to continue this conversation and this engagement with you. So best of luck with your new position. Thank you. Uh, you're always welcome down in Tampa, and I do intend to go back to your library behind your building and, uh, and get lost back there when, as soon as I get back to D.C. Uh, thank you, you for your time, everybody on the uh, webinar. Um, thanks for your patience, and, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak about a very positive vision out here, because uh, that's what I believe in my heart. Appreciate it. All right. All right. We'll see you soon, Admiral. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.